Um, my name is Yusuf Atia. I'm the Citizen Science Coordinator at Birds Canada. Um, so my role is to help manage, uh, support the Christmas bird count along with our partner um, organization, National Audubon Society. Uh, as Matt mentioned, I'm coming to you from the West Coast here in Richmond, uh, British Columbia, but I should point out that Calgary is my hometown uh, where I took part in my very first Christmas bird counts. I've got lots of fond memories with people and birds in Southern Alberta, uh, and it's nice to see a lot of familiar names on the attendee list here. So the Christmas bird count, or CBC as it's often referred to, is the oldest and longest running citizen science uh, project in the Western Hemisphere, and probably the world. As you can see from the background of uh, the background map here, um, there's where each dot represents a Christmas bird count circle, uh, well represented throughout North America, uh, into Central America, um, the Caribbean, and spreading into South America. So the CBC has an interesting history because really it was inspired by an activity that is somewhat opposite of what it accomplishes now. Uh, during the 1800s, a tradition known as the Christmas side hunt was held each year on Christmas day. And it was a festive competition where participants wandered the countryside on a hunting spree and shot at every bird and, and small animal that they saw. And at the end of the day, teams tallied their kills to find out which side uh, was the winner. At the turn of the century, an early ornithologist named Frank Chapman, uh, at the time he was a curator of Amer um, at the M American Museum of Natural History and editor for a bi-monthly magazine called Bird Lore, um, he already noticed declines in bird populations and probably already witnessed uh, some extinctions in North America. So in protest of the somewhat unnecessary side hunt, he suggested that people count birds instead. And here we have an image of some of the early birders at the bottom. This is Frank Chapman up in the top here. And some early birders. So a lot, a lot has changed in the past 120 years with respect to uh, birder dress code. Uh, apparently birders were more fashion, fashion conscious in the early 1900s. On Christmas Day, um, in the year 1900, 25 counts were conducted in North America, including two in Canada. And this is a scan of page 29 of the 1901 printing of bird lore, uh, which later became Audubon magazine. And this is where the first ever Christmas bird counts uh, were summarized. It was called the Christmas bird census in the first years. And the summaries included effort, weather, total species and uh, individuals, and some highlights. So here we have Scotch Lake, New Brunswick and uh, Toronto, Ontario, um, representing the first two. So after the preamble, the Chapman's preamble, uh, the very first two summarized Christmas bird counts are Canadian. So we were represented here in Canada from the very beginning. Most of us know how the CBC works, so uh, I'll review this part pretty quick. Uh, the concept hasn't changed in a century, really, and it's a simple one. So pick a day within the count period for a defined location, record effort, uh, which is how many people, time spent, distance traveled. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that and why that's so important. Uh, and then count birds. So it's pretty simple. Here's a calendar for December and, and early January. Uh, the red outline is the count period, okay? Uh, so between December 14th to January 5th inclusive, and an official count must be conducted within those dates each year. Um, and often large, you know, um, Christmas bird counts in urban centers are held in the first weekend of, of the period. The star is an example of a count day, which has to be conducted in one, on one calendar day this star here. And uh, interestingly enough, although the first ever Christmas bird count was done on Christmas Day, virtually none are ever held on Christmas Day or uh, Christmas Eve, um, although Boxing Day is, is often used. So, the, and then the three, the three days prior to and after count day uh, make up count week, which is um, a time where we collect presence absence data. Um, so this gives us a more complete picture of what's around. 
but really it's the the count day that have that provide the the comparable data that are important for us uh, this is what a CBC looks like on a local scale. We have the Calgary Christmas bird count here, which Phil's going to probably talk a little bit more about later. Um, each circle study area is 15 miles or 24 kilometers in diameter, uh, centered on a point of interest, usually an urban center or a park or natural area. And um, you can see that like in this example of Cal with Calgary here, that each circle is divided into smaller areas or sectors or zones. And complex circles for large cities often have even smaller subdivisions within here where, where people are allocated a certain area to cover a route. We'll zoom out a little bit and we can see this is the Calgary area with Christmas bird counts on a little bit of a broader scale. Um, the nice thing about having a number of counts around a center is that they're often conducted on different days. So participants can do the count in their city and then as well as well as participate on counts um, nearby. Uh, you zoom out even further and uh, don't worry so much about the color of the circles but each little dot represents a, a CBC um, throughout Canada. There are over 460 official Christmas bird counts uh, in, ca in Canada alone and you can see that most of the counts are uh, focused on areas where a lot of the people are. So I'll bring your attention up here on Baffin Island, and uh, this is Arctic Bay Nunavut CBC. And um, just try to imagine, let's paint a picture of what it's like to conduct a Christmas bird count up there. Uh, you have about 45 minutes of daylight uh, to count ravens. And um, that's, that's pretty much it that we actually sometimes refer to them as CRCs, Christmas raven counts. Um, you know, sometimes you'll get the odd ptarmigan, sometimes you'll get the, uh, the odd eider, or, or rare sparrow, um, but really you're looking at two or three species max. And, and so we mentioned Christmas, uh, sorry, we, we mentioned count week. And so because there's often challenging weather conditions in some of these more Northern counts, count week gives us um, an opportunity to capture some species that might be missed because of weather. Okay, let's take a closer look at effort. Um, and I'll start by saying that all effort comes from volunteers and all of them are, are important to the program. People get involved at various levels, but most people fall into the field counter or feeder counter categories here. So if you've, if you've been on a CBC before, you were probably either a field counter or a feeder counter. Um, field counters or, or bush beaters, as they're, they're called in some places, um, they conduct traveling counts within the CBC, within a circle. Um, and they'll, they'll cover usually certain portions and they'll they, and they can travel in by any means available to them usually by foot or car but there's also other acceptable methods of travel are by boat snowshoe uh, bobsled cross-country ski to name a few and the amount of coverage depends on access often and number of a number of participants feeder counters uh, contrary to the name don't go around and just count uh, bird feeders, but rather monitor birds in their yard um, by doing stationary counts. Um, and you don't necessarily need feeders, but you, but it does help to have feeders. Uh, it, they do attract birds, obviously. Compilers uh, will select a count date, organize field effort, and enter data to uh, into the Christmas bird count database. And they're often the first line of defense for vetting records. So if um, if any rare or unusual counts of birds are reported, um, the compilers will be the first to sort of follow up and seek out further documentation. Uh, a, lo a lot of circles are supported on, on a, a local scale by naturalist organizations. Um, for example, um, Nature Alberta or um, the uh, Nature Calgary or Weaselhead, all, all these organizations will help post count dates, recruit participants, arrange for post count wrap ups, uh, post count wrap ups are social events held at the end of the day where people can get together and share their sightings, um, submit their results for the day, and often it's a, a place to share some food and hot cider at the end of a cold day. Regional editors are the, the last sort of line of defense and they go into the Christmas bird count database, double checking records, um, making sure everything is entered correctly, reviewing effort. Um, and they often write up an, um, annual summaries as well. So 
all, all citizen science volunteer effort um, and, and would literally not be possible without, without um, all, all these volunteers. So why count birds um, in the winter? Um, and it happens to be just a really good time to count birds as well. Uh, one of the reasons is because birds congregate and do so um, in places that are more accessible. So if you look at the breeding distribution of a surf scoter, for example, uh, this orange peachy color here in the northern shield up to about tree line, um, you'll, you'll realize that they're very broadly distributed um, during the breeding season. So even if you were up here, you know, in June or July, you might be lucky to come across two, three, four pairs at most um, on, on different lakes, but you, but you really won't get a good, a good idea of the population like you would seeing them here. Uh, this is, these birds were photographed off the coast of Vancouver here, and um, they really congregate in, uh, during winter. Another example of a species that, that would be really hard to sample during the breeding season is uh, the golden crowned sparrow, a common bird here where I am in the lower mainland uh, in winter. And, but they breed up in the alpine of Alaska, Yukon, northern BC, and in our Rockies here in Alberta. Um, very difficult to sample during breeding just simply because of the nature of their mountainous terrain that they, that they inhabit. Okay, this is a map of the Fraser Estuary important bird area. Um, there are also important bird areas in Alberta um, and in the rest of Canada. Um, and, and because birds tend to congregate during winter, there, like, for example, here specifically at the Fraser Estuary IBA, there are more birds here during winter, uh, pound for pound, than any other season. So keeping tabs on birds in these IBAs helps establish uh, and back up the importance of these areas, which can be taken into consideration when addressing conservation concerns. Okay, so we know how the CBC works, and we've established that it's a good time to monitor birds, but what's the point? Uh, let's go back to that first issue of Bird Lore that features the CBC in 1901. And in the first passage, Chapman writes, this yellow bordered area, and I quote, the results of the census are both interesting and instructive. Interesting because they are definitive, comparative, and in a sense, personal. Instructive because they give a very good idea of the distribution of winter birds on Christmas day, with some indication of the number of individuals which may be observed in a given time. Okay, so that's not only the longest sentence ever written, it's, it also explains the vision of the Christmas bird count, which is the same to this day. Uh, Chapman goes on to even mention crossbills, uh, which is interesting because it almost alludes to how this undertaking, this new survey will be useful for monitoring uh, the eruptive nature of finches. Okay, so Chapman said that the results are interesting, uh, definitive because data are collected in a standard way, comparative in that circles can be compared geographically because they're all conducted in the same manner, and personal, um, that can be interpreted in a few different ways, but to me it's a reference to the enjoyment we get out of the survey um, and, and, and as, as participants. And enjoyment of the tradition, the fellowship with others, you know, being outside, being with birds themselves, and then he goes on to say that the survey is instructive because it gives us a snapshot of bird diversity and abundance for a given location at a moment in time. And it's this snapshot that year after year has given us a very strong and useful long-term data set. You probably heard of a recent study in the Journal of Science that found we've lost 3 billion, uh, we found lost 3 billion birds compared to 50 years ago. So in other words, there are almost 30% less birds now than there were in 1970. And CBC data were an important source used for that study. So for many of us who have been paying attention to birds, this avifauna crisis, as it's referred to, is not a surprise. But without the data to back up these studies, birds would be much worse off. There have been many other studies done using CBC data, including some looking at the effects of climate change. Uh, one study right in our own backyard in Calgary, it looked at the overwintering population of Canada geese, which increased by 700% in 30 years, um, mostly as a result of more open water on the Bow River. 
And, and these dramatic population changes undoubtedly have implications to the ecosystems and affect other species in ways that you know, we're, still, we're still trying to understand. Uh, CBC trends are available for anyone on Audubon's website. So let's look at a few examples. Um, we have American crow, uh, one of the top 10 species observed on counts in Canada. Uh, the dark blue indicates an increase of greater than two and a half percent uh, per year. And the bottom right is an abundance graph showing a steady long-term increase in abundance. So like Canada goose, they're also wintering further and further north. And um, they're also increasing as a result of, of, or benefiting probably as a result of human disturbance. Uh, rusty blackbird is an example of a species that hasn't, that doesn't, hasn't bode so well uh, because of human disturbance. And um, as we all know, has declined. Uh, dark red indicates where the bird has declined in abundance by two and a half percent per year. Um, and this, this abundance map shows between 19, between 1960, uh, mid 1960s to mid 1980s, there was a pretty dramatic decline in their population, which has not been able to recover since. Taking a look at American Kestrel's map, we, we know there are declines in the east, but regional data show that there's an increase, a, a slight increase in the west. And this might explain why overall their, their trend doesn't seem to be changing. So some, some, some species populations fluctuate geographically. And this is another way that the CBC help us focus uh, conservation efforts by region. Okay, so an opportunity to brag about being Canadian. Uh, not that we really need an excuse for that, but uh, counts in Canada are really important for monitoring uh, species, uh, monitoring some species groups. Um, the following groups uh, regularly contribute to the highest numbers of individuals for North America. We have Bohemian waxwing, snow bunting, uh, Canada jay. Species like the waxwing, for example, don't really go further south than they need to, and often are confined to uh, to Canada. Uh, species like the Canada Jay generally don't move around much at any time of the year, and most of the range is also within Canada. And other non-migratory northern species um, like woodpeckers, chickadees, um, some of the more hardy sparrows um, also are, are found in their highest numbers in Canada. Um, everyone loves owls, and we're really fortunate to regularly record uh, the North American high counts for boreal, great gray, um, snowy owl, northern hawk owl, um, and I was I was fortunate to grow up in in Calgary and and got to do a lot of Christmas bird counts, you know, to the west of the city, um, where we regularly found many of these species. And um, I, I have to say, it's one thing, it's one thing to go to a spot where people have been reporting a see uh, an owl hanging out in a spot, but it's quite another to be out on a Christmas bird count and just like stumble upon you know, a, a number of, of great gray owls. And it's a, it's a much more, um, it's a much more almost spiritual experience. Another group of birds that are recorded in high numbers in Canada are the chicken type birds. Uh, Sharp-tailed grouse, uh, we got spruce grouse, rough grouse. Um, established introduced species like gray partridge, for example, as well as chucker, um, now have their strongholds in Canada. These are species that when they were introduced had much greater ranges, but they've all sort of retracted um, and have become really difficult birds to find elsewhere in North America. Many marine birds like dovekey, um, for example, some cormorants, some gulls, shorebirds um, have strongholds in Canada. Uh, some of the regular Eurasian species like black-headed gull and tufted duck are recorded on the East Coast regularly and sometimes in high numbers. Um, if you look at Black-headed gull, 365 on one Christmas bird count in Nova Scotia in, in 2005. Uh, 78 tufted ducks um, in Newfoundland, St. John, St. John's, Newfoundland um, in 2013, that would be. We get one tufted duck, you know, on the West Coast here or in Alberta and we all lose our minds and they're counting them in numbers. Um, down here at first glance, we've got, this is, this is photograph taken in the north, northern BC coast. It looks almost like they're all just one species, but this is actually, we got rock sandpiper, black turnstone, uh, two more rock sandpipers, a surf bird, 
black turnstone and and surfbird and these are again species that are recorded in some of their highest numbers in canadian coastlines Uh, one last group of birds I'll mention that are monitored well in Canada are the eruptive finches. Species like hoary redpole winter further than most, most other songbirds. Uh, White-winged crossbill, you know, incredible birds that are tied to their food sources, to cone crops, and will, and will actually nest at any time of the year um, as long as food is available. Um, so at the bottom here, we've got a, an abundance graph looking at uh, abundance chart uh, looking at the um, the fluctuating um, records of, of finches and their eruptive nature. So in the past 50 years, it looks like although there's been lots of increases and declines, um, this, we, we, we know very little about the overall um, status of their population. That's why we need to continue to do this for many years into the future. Um, we've also learned a lot about species like crossbills and that their, their movements aren't necessarily tied north and south, but rather some of them move from east to west. And um, this year we're, we're experiencing um, an eruption of, of many of the finches. It started out with um, red-breasted nuthatches, um, which aren't a finch, but an eruptive species. Uh, then pine siskins, and then evening grosbeaks, and then pine grosbeaks. So some, some birders, you know, in the southern parts of the states are seeing many of these species for the first time. We see them pretty much most years, maybe not in the numbers that, that we're seeing this year, but we do still get them regularly. And so it's important to realize how fortunate we are here and, and in that we have a really high quality of birds. If any of you guys have um, friends in, in the tropics or even the southern states, many of them would, would salivate if you told them that we see you know, crossbills and owls and some of these uh, grouse species every year. Um, there are species that are on the tops of their wish lists for sure. One aspect that can't be understated about the CBC um, is the tradition and the importance that it's become to our community. Um, I have fond memories of my younger years in Calgary growing up um, and, and tagging along with the, the late and great Gus Yaki. Uh, he's pictured here in his element. Uh, Gus was a, was a true champion for those who knew him, a true champion of the CBC. And he did as many as physically possible every year and he did them right to the end of his days. Uh, for many of us, participating on a Christmas bird count has become a tradition. And sometimes it's the only time of year that we see and, and get to interact with some of our birder friends. Uh, in normal years, uh, the count wrap ups would be about as social as we get. And I actually remember meeting many of uh, many birders um, for the first time at, at wrap ups. And we also can't forget that we live in some pretty incredible places and some beautiful places that are enjoyed when we go out. So this, this almost alien looking landscape you might, you might recognize as the Badlands or Red Deer River Valley of Alberta. This is actually Dinosaur Provincial Park where I compiled the, the CBC for a time. And um, it's a place where I virtually wouldn't visit um, if I didn't have a reason to go to. Um, it's a place that seems desolate in the winter, but once, you, once you're there, there's actually, there are actually things going on there. Um, but the point is, it's a place I wouldn't get to if I didn't have a reason, and the Christmas bird count was that reason. When I think of community, I think of the future, and CBCs offer a unique opportunity to engage more people and introduce them to birding um, and, and, and citizen science. So for the most part in Canada, birds, bird diversity is much lower during winter, uh, birds are more visible and they can often be observed in higher numbers since they congregate. So this is really a good opportunity to show birds to people, um, which other, at the other times of the year, they might find it a little bit intimidating, overwhelming. In normal years, uh, often beginners are paired up with more experienced birders um, to show them the ropes and that's, that's a really great learning opportunity and opportunity for mentorship, much like I did. Uh, going under Gus's wings. And some people really get a kick out of taking newbies out and on CBCs and sharing, you know, sharing their enthusiasm and knowledge. And uh, a special thank you goes out to those people. You know who you are. You go out of your way to, to help the others. Uh, CBC for Kids is an entirely separate and um, increasingly popular event uh, designated to cater to children. And, and families. So these events focus on the educational aspect and have been 
they've been really successful in Canada with more and more events uh, popping up all over the country. One question I'm often asked is, what's the difference between the CBC and eBird? And do we still need the CBC in a world with eBird? And the short answer is yes, there is a difference. And yes, we do need both. Uh, one of the most obvious differences between the CBC and you know, general eBirding is coverage. And I broke down the habits of most, bird, most eBirders into three categories. There's those who go to good birding spots, which are often established hotspots. Uh, those who follow up on good sightings um, for their own interest and list keeping. And then those who sort of just bird their own local patch, um, which interestingly enough has become more popular uh, during the pandemic. Um, and obviously it's not that clear cut and everyone sort of dabbles into all these categories. But the point is, if you look on a map here, we have, you know, this is the lower mainland of BC and most of the orange and red circles are hotspots that receive a lot of checklist submissions. And on the right here, I've taken um, a sample of Golden Crown Sparrow records from one month, December of, of last year. And there's, a, there's definitely a pattern of where bird records are coming from in, when compared to where people are actually going birding. So if we overlay a Christmas bird count, for example, you can see that there are areas that aren't being covered. And um, this, it's this sort of forced coverage that happens on Christmas bird counts um, that provides a more broad scale overall estimate of bird, bird diversity and abundance for an area. And eBirding on the other hand is, is in, it's more, in some cases more precise, but it's far more variable. And eBird outputs include incidentals, point counts, uh, longer traveling lists, etc. So to summarize, the CBC is a coordinated survey with coordinated effort. And in a perfect world, we would also submit our CBC uh, to eBird Canada individually. Um, if you're an eBird user, I'd also urge you to consider participating in eBird events like the Global Big Day, um, uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count, and these, these sort of um, coordinated efforts provide a similar snapshot of bird diversity and abundance, uh, similar to what the CBC does. Um, I'd also encourage people to do more CBC style birding if they, if they get an opportunity to. Um, stay local, get to know the birds in your local patch, uh, because these data are actually more useful than us going to establish birding hotspots and, and, and birding there over and over again. So what, what do these birds have in common? Um, red wing, Siberian accent or field fair, brambling. Uh, this is a red wing photographed in Salmon Arm, BC. Uh, so if you said they're all species that are Eurasian or, or uh, near Arctic, you'd be right. If you said that they're all species discovered on a Christmas bird count, you'd also be right. But again, what you might not be thinking about is that for the most part, these were birds found in areas where people don't typically go birding or at least locations that receive uh, less coverage. So everyone, everyone knows that, that Christmas bird counts turn up goodies. Um, and it's large in part to this indiscriminate coverage that we, that we force people to do on Christmas bird counts. Um, these are just a few examples of the mega rarities. Um, and the more people that get involved with Christmas bird counts in the future, the more opportunity we have to turn up these, these Christmas treats. So I will say that this, these rarities are fun, but it's really the monitoring of the common or ubiquitous species that, um, especially of the northern species groups, um, that are useful for driving um, trends and, and useful for conservation environment and environmental management. And that leads me to my final discussion point, which is what happens when something changes effort or cancels a Christmas bird count altogether? Something like a freak Snowstorm, this photograph was taken by um, our Atlantic regional uh, editor on the CBCs and my friend Jared Clark in Newfoundland. Um, what happens when something cancels the Christmas bird count altogether? Um, and the answer, or, or, you know, or a pandemic is like we're experiencing now. And the, uh, the answer is that it, the data will not be significantly altered or otherwise compromised. And the reason for that is because we do have the strength in this long-term data set. Uh, let's look at this graph again, you know, um, this long-term trend. So if we were to lose one year, two years, or had altered data in those years, 
Um, it would not change the fact that we know that this species has been declining for the past 50 years, or sorry, increasing in abundance for the past 50 years. So that's why it's so important to continue monitoring birds in the same way uh, every year. Um, in addition to the abundance trends, that uh, in, the abundance trends account for changes in effort using an algorithm during the analysis. So as long as we know that effort data that I, that I mentioned right at the beginning, as long as we know how many people there are, are, are watching birds um, and how much time they spend and how much distance they covered, we can actually account for any changes in effort. So if there's half as many participants this year than there were last year, and we have half as many birds counted, we can account for that using this algorithm and account for it in the trend analysis. Uh, when the pandemic hit in the spring of 2020, <laughs> um, the CBC seemed a long ways off. And, and, but here we are on the doorstep of the Christmas bird count, and it's still very much a concern. So one thing for sure is that Christmas bird counts are going to look different this year. Um, and that it really won't be an event, but rather just a coordinated survey. So many of the community aspects, the wrap ups that we talked about, the educational opportunities, a lot of that stuff just won't be possible this year, unfortunately. Um, I, I just want to mention a few things like to, to keep safety, um, you know, your number one priority um, in all your actions. Um, always follow your local public health authority guidance. Uh, you can visit our website at birdscanada.org forward slash CBC for more information on, the, on those guidance. Um, things like traveling between cities or health units. If, if our, our public health authority says that we shouldn't do that, then we, we just don't. And um, if that means that we don't participate in the same way, or if we spend more time doing feeder counting this winter, then, then that's what happens. Um, but again, it won't, it won't really make that big a difference to the data set. Um, having said that, there's no pressure for, any, for anyone to participate this year. So if you do feel that you, you, you just want to sit this one out, Birds Canada and our partner Audubon will fully support anyone who chooses not to be involved um, at any level. And since it looks like we're all going to be a bit, a bit more hunkered down than usual this year, um, there are some programs you can do from home that um, will keep you engaged. The, the Project Feeder Watch um, is a great sort of introductory program to citizen science, and you can do it from the comfort of your own home. Um, Project Feeder Watch runs from November through April. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have feeders either. You just need to have access to a spot where you can count birds uh, throughout the winter on a somewhat regular basis. Uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count takes place over four days in, in February, so it's sort of a late winter mini CVC in effect. And uh, you don't necessarily have to be confined to your backyard for that one. You can actually go to your local, your local patch um, or another birding spot. So I encourage folks to, to uh, look into these programs. Some final thoughts on the Christmas bird count. Um, so consider helping out on one or two Christmas bird counts if you don't already. Uh, again, not necessarily this year. This is sort of my general guidance. Um, Try eBirding your Christmas bird count results if you can. Uh, there's some helpful guidance on eBird.ca on eBird Canada on how to do this. Um, and for some, some circles are actually having participants submit their results through eBird checklist submissions. Um, I will, I'll also use this opportunity to remind people to be responsible about feeding birds. Um, uh, to reduce the spread of disease, please consider cleaning your feeders um, at least every couple of weeks. Um, make, your make your yards bird friendly by planting native plants, keep your cats indoors, all, the, all that good stuff. Um, and one last reminder to, to please be safe and responsible. Thank you to everyone who's ever participated in the Christmas bird count um, over the years. And, and, and if you haven't participated, it's really not too late to get involved. Um, this year is a bit of an anomaly, but uh, hopefully things will be back to normal next year It'll be business as usual, and um, we, we want you to make the Christmas bird count part of your tradition going forward. Visit birdscanada.org forward slash CBC for more information, and thank you. Great, you said thanks so much. Really hoping that this year goes forward and uh, we can get some people going for this. Um, there's a couple of questions that came in, but we're going to hold off 
Phil is the Christmas bird count compiler for Calgary. Uh, so, Phil, if you're ready to go, you can begin to share your screen. Thank you very much. So, um, thanks again, Matt and, and Weaselhead, for in, inviting me along this evening. Uh, Yusuf, I really enjoyed your talk, and uh, um, I actually remember doing some uh, Christmas bird counts in and around Calgary with Yusuf uh, about 20 years ago, and I always thank him for finding me my first northern pygmy out, out near um, Cochrane, so or Water Valley. So I've uh, got some good memories there, and that's, as Yusuf said, one of the benefits of these counts is, is meeting other birders, uh, some of whom you stay in touch with for a lifetime. So, um, the Calgary Christmas bird count this year is scheduled for Sunday, December the 20th. Um, as Yusuf mentioned, a lot of the counts go in the first week of the count period, and we always have ours on the first Sunday of the count period, which this year is the 20th. Our first uh, CBC was in 1952, which was already the 53rd of the Audubon series, which started in 1900. Um, we've been going for 68 continuous years from 1952 until last year. And um, I think we can see a way through to do number 69 this year, despite, despite COVID. Um, there's a lot of uh, people who want to do it, and I'm sure we can do it safely. Yusuf again mentioned that the count circle um, is 15 miles in diameter. In our case, it's centered on the Louise Bridge. Uh, the 10th Street Bridge, and this never changes. And I often get asked questions by people, well, you know, why don't we just uh, do Calgary? Why do we have to do this uh, arbitrary circle? Well, I guess we do because we do. Um, the, the circle was set up um, and actually very, very well set up. Um, it works out pretty well, but whereas in the beginning years of the count, the circle was entirely um, uh, outside, or the, the, the edge of it was outside the city of Calgary limits. Now it's the other way around and we're just um, within Calgary, um, which is spread outside. We've had between 200 and 250 participants in recent years. That would be a sort of 125 to 150 uh, field observers, field counters if you like, and, and the other uh, 100 or so are feeder watchers. I suspect this year we may have more feeder watchers uh, because of the things we've been talking about. So again, number 69, December the 20th. Um, Yusuf stole this uh, slide from me, uh, so you've had a little preview of it. Um, the reason for these particular divisions that we have are that when I took over in uh, 2002, um, these were the areas that had sort of traditionally been assigned and I kind of um, never really been mapped out. So one of the things I did was to make sure everybody knew where their boundaries were. Um, so it's rather a, a, a hodgepodge, but I was interested to hear that some counts have even finer uh, graduations than, than this. And as a matter of fact, this year, because of the way we're going to run things, um, we are going to be splitting these routes up into um, smaller, smaller sections. Now the weasel head, which you're interested in, is in the southwest part of the circle. Um, actually, it's, it's the weasel head in Glenbow Park is covered by um, four different routes. Or W8 is uh, entirely in the weasel head. Um, Glenbow Park is is partly in W5 and partly in W7, which is the one I do myself. Um, and then W10 is on Sutina lands. Um, which Matt is uh, planning to uh, take over this year. We haven't run it for a couple of years, uh, partly because of the stony trail uh, construction made that rather unfeasible. And anybody who wants to be a feeder watcher, one thing I need to point out is that they um, need to live within the count circle. Um, unfortunately, we get people every year who want to be feeder watchers, but they live down close to Fish Creek Park, which is below the, uh, uh, the bottom south of the circle and therefore um, can't be feeder watchers. 
not at least for the Christmas bird count, but for many other purposes, of course they can. So over the years, um, the number of birds seen has increased dramatically. Uh, this is for all birds, uh, all species added together. And in the early years, there's just a, a few hundred, um, which to a large extent uh, reflected the amount of effort going into it. Um, but also as time has gone along, uh, the opening up of the Bow River has meant that we get to uh, very good numbers of, of waterfowl. Um, and they do tend to uh, dominate the list somewhat. The number of species, um, the, the line shows the number of species per year. And again, as effort has increased from the early days, it's uh, gradually increased uh, up to between 60 and 70, basically. Um, we have one wonderful year of, of 78 species, and my goal has always been to get to 80, didn't quite make it that year, and a couple of years in the uh, low to mid 70s, but generally 60 to 70 um, is about where we end up. So the 20 year average is 66. We've seen 139 species cumulatively over the, um, the period, the 68 years. Um, 16 species have been added since 2000, so we keep uh, notching them up, uh, not every year, but uh, um, still, uh, still getting, adding at roughly one a year. And then of the 139, 22 of them have only been seen in one year. So if you go out and you find a, a bird like that, then you're very, very excited. So our top 10 for all counts, um, mallard, uh, Bohemian Waxwing, which I will address a little bit more, Canada Goose, House Sparrow, Rock Pigeon, Black-billed Magpie, Common Goldeneye, black Cap Chickadee, Common Redpole, and European Starling. Um, it's not a very uh, uh, inspiring list, I have to say, um, although uh, I should mention that in some years we have been the, the high count for North America for House Sparrow. We've, sorry, uh, we've also been uh, uh, the high count on occasion for black for uh, black billed magpie and also bohemian waxwing and uh, merlin also we have sometimes been the high count for north america so there are some species that specialize in the, the that we do well in in calgary so as i mentioned i'll talk a little bit more about bohemian waxwing and common red pole these are both eruptive species um, as europe uh, Yusuf introduced us to that concept. Uh, their numbers vary dramatically from year to year. So some years, uh, as you can see, we get very, very few bohemian waxwings, um, just a couple of years when they've been very, very low. Um, and some years, uh, close to 20,000 or close to it. And those are the great years when you see just huge blocks flying around uh, and descending on your mountain ash trees and uh, devouring the berries. So that's another, you know, really nice bird to see on a Christmas bird count. And common red pole, um, another highly eruptive species. Again, years when we get none, and then years when we get as many as, as, as a couple of thousand. And of course, if you go in the countryside uh, outside of Calgary, you can see many more. Uh, we've actually had very low numbers the last three years. And from what I can see, unless there's a big change, we're not going to have a uh, a good year for red poles again. And you can see it's kind of rare for us to have uh, more than uh, a couple of bad years in a row. Um, so it could be just bad luck again, we'll see. So factors affecting uh, results on a long-term basis. Um, growth in the city of Calgary, as I mentioned, uh, used to be within the circle and now it's outside. Uh, loss and de degradation of habitat associated with this growth. Um, on the other hand, we have, uh, such as your society, uh, conservation efforts, which have uh, helped a great deal uh, for some species. We uh, have a prevalence of bird feeders now, so things like chickadees, nuthatches, downy woodpeckers, we probably see a lot more of those than, than we used to because they're, they're attracted to the feeders. They're, they are, um, they're all resident birds, um, but they're easier to count when they're coming uh, within, within a few feet of your, uh, uh, of your window. 
And then climate change, uh, it's very difficult on the basis of just one count over a 50 year period to come up with any really definitive results there, but uh, unquestionably it, uh, it, it's factoring in. Unfortunately, because of um, loss of habitat on the edge of the city, um, we've lost um, quite a few species in recent years. Um, things like sharp-tailed grouse, golden eagle, snowy owl, short-eared owl, um, Canada jay, evening grosbeak, um, which is more of an eruptive species. The, these we don't see as often as we used to. And um, a really dramatic one is snowy owl, where <clears throat> it's hard to imagine, but in the, in the 70s, they were getting as many as 15 birds in a count. So on one day within the count circle, which is within the city of Calgary. Today, you'd be very lucky to see that uh, number of snowy owls if you, if you drove around the countryside for a few days in a row. Um, I'm sure they're out there, but they're far more dispersed and, and it must have been wonderful to see that many snowy owls in the day. As you can see in the bottom right here, we're down to zero now. Now, uh, I mentioned that the number of waterfowl has really increased since the 60s um, and since the Bow River has been staying open all winter. Um, we are up to generally around uh, 30,000 uh, species of waterfowl, the vast majority of which are Canada geese and mallards. Uh, number three would be common golden eye, followed by bufflehead and merganser. Uh, so they're sort of the big five. Uh, but interestingly, we have a greater diversity going along with the greater numbers, and we now have seen as many as um, 19 different kinds of waterfowl in, in one count, and we're running in the sort of 15-ish range. So five of them, as I mentioned, are you know, seen in good numbers, but the others are seen uh, just, a, just a handful. Um, but we have some dedicated birders who, who work and, uh, by the river and pick through the flocks to find uh, the, the, the extra special ones, pintail, widgeon, um, hooded merganser, so on and so forth. And this year, we hope we may have a, um, a long-tailed duck on the count, which it hasn't been for many years, because there's one in Carbon Park or on the river in Carbon Park and has been around for a while. So we hope it'll stay just a little longer. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, bald eagle, um, has also increased um, a lot over the years. And that also, I think, reflects the larger number of waterfowl on the river, because as you probably know, bald eagles just love to pick off a, a sick or a dying mallard um, and makes a good meal for them. So they, they hang out in the city in the winter, but not very much in the, in the summer. When you go down birding, uh, in, in the, the winter by the river, um, everybody will say to you, they see you've got binoculars or a scope or a camera, and they'll say, oh, have you seen the bald eagle? Um, and yes, you have, <laughs> but you wonder if there's anything uh, even more interesting to see. So annual variables make a big difference for us. Um, the weather, the degree of open water, which reflects the weather prior to the count, the cone and berry crop, very important for finches and, and wax wings and other things and the degree of birding effort, which has been generally pretty constant over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, but we did have, I'll, I'll point out, our count day temperature um, kind of runs all over the place. This is the average of the, of the high and the low for the, um, the count day. And there was a horrendous year here, minus 30. And then this one here was about minus 28, I well remember. Um, and that was when we had a snowstorm came in two days before the count and then an Arctic front set in um, and really uh, made a, a big difference. So when it's cold and snowy, birds remain dormant and quiet. Um, waterfowl um, are forced to migrate because of uh, um, deep snow cover in the fields. They, they can't uh, get a free snack, so they have to leave, leave the area. And we have fewer birders in the field, um, more time is spent in the car. You're certainly going to see more birds if you get out and walk around. Access difficult due to deep snow and 
and river fog can be a, a real problem when it gets cold. So I thought I'd finish with some weasel head um, specialties for those of you who um, uh, want to go to the weasel head uh, any time uh, of the year or particularly in the winter and just ideally on, uh, on count day. This is what a normal group looks like uh, walking in the weasel head. We won't have this many people uh, walking together this year for obvious reasons, but uh, it was a beautiful day. Um, and uh, here's some of the specialties. So um, boreal chickadee, that's a year round resident, but uh, often better seen in the, in the winter. Uh, likewise with golden crown kinglet, um, another one of my favorite birds. And, and then the two species of crossbill white winged and uh, red crossbill. White winged is uh, the more common of the two, um, but either of these can be seen in the city and, and the weasel head would be as good a place as any. Um, Pileated woodpecker, you're all familiar with, I'm sure, is a spectacular bird. Um, we almost every year get pileated woodpecker, we're not guaranteed. Northern sawwood owl, I would say the same. Um, weasel head is as good a place as, as any to see that. There have been a couple seen in the city in recent uh, days, um, one in Confederation Park and the other in uh, Carbon Park, so perhaps we'll get lucky and get one on the count. And then rough grouse, um, again the weasel head, one of the few places in the city where you can see this bird now, um, and pine grosbeak. So this is the, uh, the information, the contact information. Um, this is my email address. The feeder watcher's Bob the Thieve um, is going to be handling that part of it. And uh, here's his email. I think this is going to be posted on your website. Um, Dan Arndt is responsible for Route W8, which is the weasel head. And then Matt is going to take over doing the Sutina lands this year, which is W10. And Matt can also be a go-to for uh, um, anybody else who has inquiries and, and he'll make sure that uh, um, we address your interest and uh, hopefully include you. It's going to be easier this year to be a feeder watcher than a, a, a new, newcomer feeder field observer uh, because of the circumstances we find ourselves in but we'll certainly do our best. And I think that uh, finishes me.